Oh, wow. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, let's open our Bibles. First John is where we're going to be today, but before we do that, I'd like for us to start in the book of Romans. So just do me a favor, we're going to do our Bible drills today. Flip over to Romans chapter 1, or if you've got your, uh, your smartphone with you, you use the Version app or several other good Bible apps, just, just jump over to Romans 1, because we are we're going to be changing up our sermon series for the next few weeks, and I want to give you a reason why. We're going to be doing a series called God Is. Now, if you've been around for a minute, you know that we did a series before called God Is, and, uh, and we're coming back to that and doing some things that are a little bit different. So Romans chapter 1, verse 25, as Paul is starting... The, the process of, um, of teaching the book of Romans, which is just an unbelievable amount of information about the nature and character of God, one of the more helpful books in the whole Bible, especially the New Testament, just in terms of understanding the implications of the gospel. Here's what he says. Start in verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Now, here's the important thing. He's talking about sinners and the fact that they have walked away from the truth, it's not, even so, it's not even so important to understand the nature of the sin as it is to understand the importance that they are consumed by sin. But look at verse 25, because it's going to give you the reason that these people have been consumed by sin, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Most, or if not all, of our faulty thinking about God can be explained in that one verse, to exchange the truth about God for a lie and to serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And we know this to be true because often when we don't quite know how to explain God, what we can do sometimes is try to define God in our own terms, to talk about God in human terms. And there are certainly analogies in the Bible. There are ways that that God is compared in some ways, but he is wholly different. He is totally different than we are in a lot of ways. And understanding him is the key to growing in godliness because our relationship with God is just that. It's a relationship. And one of the key components to understanding how to grow and cultivate a relationship is growing in your understanding of the person with whom you're in a relationship. It would seem absurd for us to say, I want to grow in my relationship to my wife by not speaking to her for 20 years. Something would happen to your relationship, but it would not be growth. And the end fact is, and, and, and as all of us as husbands ought to know, the role, one of the key roles of a husband is to pursue and continue an understanding of his wife. The longer you get married to somebody, it's true of wives too, the longer you're married to somebody, the more you should grow to understand more about them. Our love becomes informed over time. That's how this thing works. It's also how Christianity works. The hard part is that many of us are afraid of the two words doctrine or theology because we somehow think that it would somehow dampen our understanding of God. That is absolute hogwash. The more I know about God, the more my passion for God should grow, the more my, uh, more my understanding of God grows, the more my love for him should grow, and the more my devotion to him grows. The problem is not that we don't, is not that understanding about God is bad, it's just that many of us have managed to make it through a large part of our Christian life without ever bothering to do the hard work of understanding more about him. That's why we're doing this series. It's because the essential component to growing in godliness begins first with knowing more about the God that you desire to grow in. And so we're starting this series this time. The last time we did all of the many of the ways in which God is, is not like us. So if you remember last year, we talked about God being all-powerful. Much to our chagrin, we are not all-powerful. God being all-knowing, you also are not all-knowing, nor am I. The ways that God is not like us this time what I'd like for us to do is take a few weeks and examine some ways in which we ought to be like God. What godliness means is imitating the nature and character of the God we profess to serve, right? That is literally the definition of godliness, looking like God. So let's talk about what God looks like. And the first one out of the box that I want us to talk about is going to come from 1 John. So now, turn over to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to talk about the fact that God is love. Now, you don't have to go far in our culture 
to, um, to hear someone that clearly does not understand what love actually is and yet really, really wants us to get their understanding and to adopt their definition of what love is. I'm reminded of a movie that came out before many of you were born. Uh, I think it came out before I was born. It's called Love Story. It came out in the 1970s. And the most popular line from the movie Love Story is love means never having to say you're sorry. Now, again, if you've been married longer than 10 minutes, you know that that is not true. In fact, that's quite possibly the worst definition of love, isn't it? In fact, what happens is those whom we love, when we have offended and hurt them, we ought to be quick to say, I'm sorry, and some few other things that make it biblical forgiveness. But the world loads this word. In fact, it's to the point that when we talk about the love of God, the word love has been so misconstrued and so wrongly used in our culture that the English word love is hardly worthy of the name of God anymore. The problem is we don't have a better one because English is very limited. We have one word. So I could say, I love God. I could say, I love my wife and my son. I could say, I love ice cream and pizza and the Green Bay Packers. And I'm using the same word to mean all of those things. But those things are true on very different levels. I do not, or at least ought not, love pizza in the same way that I love my son, who loves pizza, but doesn't love pizza in the same way that he loves me. You guys follow me? So the word has been so weakened. Now, here's what is even worse. It's been even more weakened in the church. In fact, it's gotten to the point in our culture where the surefire way to be sure that you draw a crowd is by singing praise songs that have these vague and unhelpful concepts of love and preaching sermons that have unintelligible ideas about what love is so that everybody walks away with a warm, fuzzy feeling about the love of God, but nobody can actually define what it is. If you want to see a church explode, just do those things. Turn on your television. Later on today, you'll see churches that have made a mockery of God by creating these weak, flaccid definitions of love and somehow encouraging people to continue on in these things without actually understanding what the love of God is because it is so much greater than it would be defined that way. So enter the Gospel of John and the letters of John. John is the love guy. Like we typically give Paul like one chapter on love. I would say you could give John four books on love. The Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Ultimately, every book that he writes, every letter that he's written is intended to teach us something about the love of God. And so we know one of the more famous passages about the love of God is going to be from 1 John chapter 4. So I want to read verses 7 through 12. That's what we're going to be talking through today. And I want us to learn what it means when we say that God is love. Let's start in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Let's pray together. Father, my prayer is as we study you, as we spend time together really considering what the love of God means. I pray that our minds would be trained, certainly, but I pray that the training of our minds would lead to the inflaming of our hearts, which would be presented through changed behavior so that we might show the world what the love of God looks like and is like, because you have called and commissioned us to do that very thing. And so we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, 1 John is one of my favorite books of the whole Bible, the running joke. Every time I start a new book, I typically say that, and it's almost always true. Um, so, so first John, but really and truly, when I'm talking to a new believer in Christ, you may be a person who's desiring to learn more about Jesus, and you've never spent a lot of time in the Bible. I honestly think first John is a great place to go, and I'm going to tell you why. See, our problem with John 
is not that he's not clear. Our problem with John is that he is so doggone clear that it's really hard to not understand what he's saying. It's not a problem of understanding, it's a problem of application. This passage is one of those examples, but if you want to summarize the whole book of 1 John, I think 1 John chapter 3, verse 23 is a helpful way of doing it. Here's what he says in 1 John 3. It says, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he has commanded us. I think that verse summarizes the entire book of 1 John. I think if you want to break all of 1 John down into two big buckets and put everything that John's saying into these two big buckets, I think start off believing in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and then loving one another just as he has commanded us, which sounds familiar, right? Jesus said there's two great commandments in the Bible, and what are they? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and... That's right, love your neighbor as yourself. So what you see is John has literally structured his entire letter around how to do those two things. This is why understanding God is so critical to John because really you, don't, you, you can't love a God rightly that you don't understand in the ways that he has revealed. Now we have said multiple weeks, and it is still true, that we will not understand all of God's plan. Our pea brains are not big enough to grasp and comprehend everything there is to understand about God. It doesn't matter how smart you are. Right? That's just true. But at the same time, he has revealed himself in some very clear ways through his Bible. And what we ought to be doing is growing in our understanding of the way that he has revealed himself. And the way that we do that, as we grow in that understanding, it should improve, it should change our affections. So we want to understand who he is. And we want to desire to know more of him. So here's how we're going to do this with this particular subject today. First, we're going to define love. We're going to define what it means that God is love. Okay, we're going to get a definition. Second, I want us to see how God has demonstrated his love through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And then third, I want us to see how those two things affect the way we ought to live our lives and love one another. You got it? We're going to do a definition. We're going to talk about Jesus, and then we're going to talk about how the definition plus Jesus equals changed us. That's the whole sermon. Now, hang around. I got more to say, but that's the whole thing in three points. All right, first, love. God is Love. So let's start by rightly defining. Let's get a good working definition of love. So I'm going to start with a definition, and then we're going to unpack a little bit, okay? Love is an earnest and pure desire for someone that is demonstrated through commitment and self-sacrifice. Now, that will not fly in the world because that is not at all how the world defines love. In fact, it's probably not how you defined love the first time you saw the person that you fell in love with because we use the word in a way that God is not using the word when he's using it in the Bible. Okay? It's an earnest and pure desire for someone demonstrated through commitment and self-sacrifice. I talk about this a lot. If you come to my office and we spend time talking about marriage, you know, the common refrain in our culture when marriages or relationships fall apart, is I just don't love this person or that person anymore. That is not a grounds for no longer being in a relationship with that person. That is an indictment against your inability or inactivity to understand the gospel. Because, the God, because love is predicated on two things, service, sacrifice. Those things are what make love. Okay? The, the relationships that work for a long time, the people who've been married for many, many years, will tell you, that those things are the essence of what makes a relationship last. And so what that is is the purest form of love. That is the way that we see love defined in the Scriptures. That is the way we see love defined as we're talking about who God is. So love is not, then, a few things. Number one, love is not an emotion. Now, we may be feeling some things because we have decided to do some things, but here's the reality. Someday, at some point, you're going to wake up next to the person that you've been married to for a long time, and you're not going to be feeling it. It doesn't matter how you feel. Right, that's, 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 my, that's my marriage counseling thing. So you've heard it. You come to my office. That's what I'm going to give you. Right? I don't really care how you feel. I care what the Bible says, and I care how the Bible is going to change your heart, and your heart, which controls your emotions, your mind goes into your heart, your heart comes out into your fingers. It starts with this. If I understand the way the Bible's defined love, then i got to understand it's got to start with not, it's not a feeling. Now, I'm the feelingest guy that you ever did meet. Right? I can get weepy singing songs or watching Disney movies. It still doesn't matter how I feel, okay? So this is true. 
Number one, is this not a feeling? Number two, it is not a state that you fall into. Can I ask you one request? I got two requests of you. One now, I'm going to give you one later. Please, when you talk about your relationship with Jesus Christ, do not talk about how you fell in love with Jesus. Because that's not how the Bible talks about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? You also don't fall in love with your spouse. You may feel some things, right? But love is a commitment. It's a decision. And when those feelings go away, what's left is actual love. Right? And so it's not something that you fall into. And then third, if those two things are true, then we see this. It is not effortless. In fact, anyone that I know and respect. My parents in March will celebrate 50 years of being married to one another. They are listening right now. Hey, Mom. Hey, Dad. And they will tell you, they don't live here, so they watch online, but they will tell you that the thing that will define a relationship that lasts a long time is effort. Work. Work. It requires work. So, young person, thinking about marrying somebody, let me let you in on a little secret. It is going to require work, and it probably does not feel like it right now. It does not feel like it's very much work. That's because you don't know all the things that you don't know about that person. Eventually, it is going to be work. I promise you. Here's the thing, Christian. Eventually, your walk with the Lord is going to feel like work. It is okay for your walk with Jesus to feel like effort, because you know what that means? It means it's worthwhile. Nothing in this world that is worthwhile does not require work or effort. That includes our walk with the Lord. And so it's an encouragement to understand it's not these things. Okay, it's easier sometimes to say what something isn't than it is to say what what it is. So let's talk about what it is. Love is, first, self-sacrificing. We're thinking particularly about the love of God. Love seeks to give, not to get. You understand, right? At the very core of the gospel is there's not one thing in you that was worth saving other than you were created in the image of God, and God in his infinite pleasure spoke into your heart and changed you. He did not save you because you were more clever than the person you're sitting next to. He didn't save you because you're more attractive or good-looking or smarter. You had all these great abilities that he just couldn't do without. God does not need you. He is a self-existent, self-sufficient being. He doesn't need his creation. And yet, because the very essence and nature of God is love, he saved you. He called you. He brought you out of darkness and into light. And so we love the way that God loves because that's who he is. Love seeks the good of others. It seeks to give in order to see another benefit. Love expects nothing in return. We're going to see this in this passage. While we were yet enemies of God, he loved us. Finally, love is most clearly expressed. This is a hard one for everybody, right? Love is most clearly expressed toward the way we treat our enemies. Love is most clearly expressed in the way we treat those we don't like. Now, how do I know that? Well, because that's what Jesus said. And it's what Jesus did. When God loved you, we're going to read at the end, at the end of every service, we read a passage from the Scripture, and we're going to read from the book of Romans, and it says, while we were yet enemies, he loved us. Christ died for us while we were enemies of God. The clearest expressions of love are not seen in the way that we love the people that are easy to love. They're seen in the way that we love the unlovable. And I know you have unlovable people in your life. All of us have people that are difficult for us to love. That does not take God by surprise, and it is an essential part of your godliness to learn what it means to love those people. Love is not just an expression of who God is. Love is who God is. So when God said, when, when John says God is love, he's not saying God is like love. Or he's not even saying God is loving. He's saying love is an essential characteristic of God. And that love originates in himself. God's love, God is the source of love. He, love comes from him and emanates into his creation because he is love. It also means he doesn't reactively love. God's love is not reactive, it's proactive. You guys understand the difference between reactive and proactive? Proactive, reactive means someone loves me first and so I love them back. Proactive means I love you. It doesn't matter if you love me back. 
That's the kind of love that God extends towards his creation. He, love originates in him and moves forward. This is how John could say, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins, or as the propitiation for the sins in the ESV. I had a hard time. I memorized this off of a song, children's song, called GT, and so I always read it differently than it reads in the ESV. So, sorry about that. Okay, his love is self-originating. It is a holy love. Now, this is important. Last time when we started the God is series, we talked about holiness first, right off the bat. And we talked about holiness as the way which we understand God to be, Right? So his love is a holy love. And holy means a couple of things. First and primary, love means, uh, sorry, holy means different, set apart. His love is different than ours. God loves differently, fundamentally, than we do. Right? His love is not based on how good or bad anyone's been on any particular day because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right? His love is different, it's set apart, but it's also pure, unstained. The very best we can hope for is mostly pure love because we are still sinners. And sometimes our love is a little wishy-washy based on a number of factors. And we don't want to say that. But our love can be wishy-washy based on whether or not our spouse has put the dishes away or put their socks in the hamper or or did dinner or burned something or whether our kids were obedient or not obedient. Now, we don't always want to say that. We don't want to make verbal affirmation of the fact that our love is wishy-washy. But your love is wishy-washy, and so is mine. We're just loaded with wishy-washy. God is not. That's not who he is. His love is unchanging. That's how we can say you cannot out God's grace. Because his grace is greater. His love is greater. That's not an excuse to sin. That's a reason why you can, oh, you can overcome sin. We're afraid to say that, but it's true. If you've really been freed from sin, why would you want to put the chains back on? Why would you want to put yourself back into voluntary slavery? And so his love is holy. It's different. It's pure. And God is the source of all true love. So this is what we mean when we say God is love. And it would have been totally sufficient for the Bible to have just said that and for us to be, okay, God is love. Awesome. But instead, but what John's going to do instead is he's going to give us the clearest example of how we know that God is love. And that is through the person and work of Jesus Christ. We see love in action in the work of Christ. Love took on flesh for us. The love of God, which originates in God, has descended to heaven, and, has descended from heaven to earth and taken on flesh. This is how we read in the Bible that greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. And then we go see it taken one step farther and realize it wasn't just that Christ laid down his life for his friends. He laid down his life for his enemies. And we were his enemies. And so we live now through the Son. So in verse 7, he says, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Now look, let's skip to verse 9 real quick. We're going to come back to verse 8, because that one's going to hit us right in the forehead, so hold on. Verse 9, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So we see this work. This is how Paul in Galatians 2.20 could say, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Because of the love of Christ, I now live in Christ. I live through the Son. The Son loved me and gave me life. That's why I love the passage in Ephesians 2 that says, you were dead in trespasses and sins, but God made you alive. Why did he make you alive? Because God is love. He made you alive. Christ has saved us, and we are changed. And so we are atoned through the work of the Son. Now, if you don't know what the word propitiation or atonement means, it just means this. It means that when Jesus dies for us, when we confess our sins, when we repent of our sins and place our, place our faith in the Lord Jesus, God the Father looks at us and declares us not just not guilty. It gets better than that. Sometimes we stop short. It's not just that God has looked at me and said I'm not guilty. It's that God has looked at me and said I'm righteous because I have the righteousness of Christ given to me. I am declared righteous. Now, how does that work? Because I know me. I know I'm not righteous. It's because I have his righteousness given to me. So I am atoned through the work of the Son. His death on the cross was the perfect expression of his love and, by the way, of his wrath. Sometimes we just see the cross and see the love of God. Friends, may I encourage you to see the cross for what it is. It is not just the love of God. 
It is also the wrath of God, perfectly executed on the Son, so that those who look on the Son might live. That's very important to know. He is love, but there is also a reality that he is also wrathful. And I believe that because I believe that's what the Bible teaches. And it's hard for us to work those things out in our minds. I would encourage you to stay around. We're going to spend a few sermons on all these different attributes of God. And one of them we're going to talk about is the justice of God. And that is a real thing that we need to come to terms with. That is what we see in the cross. We see the wrath of God placed on Christ because of the eternal self-giving love of God while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. We were enemies of God. And the greatest expression of love in all of creation occurred as the infinite self-giving love of God led to the death of the only sinless man who because of the love of Christ for the Father and for the creation gave himself freely to be a curse for us so that we, the guilty ones, would be alive and free and not guilty but declared righteous by the work of Christ. Now, can you see now why Jesus prioritized love your enemies and pray for those who are persecuting you? He prioritized that because that is literally and exactly what he did. And Christians are people who act like Jesus. Can we all agree on that? Christians are people who strive to act like Jesus. And if we strive to act like Jesus, then we love our enemies. There has rarely been a time in history where we as a culture need to really grasp that concept because we have hit the point in American culture where everyone who does not agree with me is considered to be my enemy. That is incredibly unfortunate, but it is true. The call of the Christian is to speak the truth in love. We are finding that it's easy to err on either side of these things. We just speak the truth completely absent of love, which is sin. Or we just act loving without speaking the truth, which is not actually love. And so we are called to speak truthfully, but also charitably. If you are incapable of speaking with charity, then I want to encourage you to come back to the scriptures and read and heed the words of our Lord Jesus. And so, we see Christ having done this while we were yet sinners. Friends, let me ask you, on a personal level, who is it in your life that you might not put the label enemy on, but you're not real big fans of those people? Maybe they are enemies. Maybe they are people that, you, that have wronged you, that have legitimately and really hurt you, done real bad things to you. Can I encourage you, friends, that the gospel call to freedom is the call to being willing to forgive? Now, let me explain why. The essence of the gospel is an understanding that you will never, ever, ever be wronged by anyone else as much as you have wronged God. No one will ever be able to offend you, hurt you, in the ways that you have offended God. And yet, what does the gospel say that Christ has done from you? From the cross, what is Jesus' cry? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Friends, the freedom of the gospel is in realizing that if my master can do that, he's not only done it, he's given me the freedom to be able to do it because Christ has broken the chains of slavery that marked us by being sinners that were not saved. Why then would we want to put the chains of slavery and unforgiveness back on? Holding resentment in our hearts is essentially choosing voluntary spiritual slavery. Somehow believing that me putting the chains on is going to be more freeing than being liberated by Jesus to love my enemies and pray for those who are persecuting me. Friends, Christians forgive. Non-Christians hold bitterness and resentment until the day they die. I would encourage you, hear the gospel, Christian. Let the Spirit move in your heart in such a way that you would find freedom. I know it's hard. I get that. 
Everything about Christianity is hard. It does not surprise me that being forgiving is hard. You know why? Because Christianity is hard. We are called to be forgiving people. And to be unforgiving is not going to hurt the person that you're not forgiving. It is only hurting you. Christ has forgiven us. And so we can be forgiven. And here's why. Because God's love is so much better than unconditional love. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. I said there are two things that I want to encourage you to do in this sermon in terms of the way we communicate the love of God. Number one, we said a few minutes ago, was to not talk about falling in love with Jesus. Like, I, no, I can't, I can't handle, my brain can't handle that concept. Number two, is I want to encourage you to think of different ways to communicate the love of God other than using the word unconditional. Now, let me explain why, because for some of us, this may be a shock, okay? I know what we mean when we say that word. I know what people are saying when they're saying that word. And I agree with everything you're saying. When we say that God's love is unconditional, here's what we usually mean. Number one, we mean God's love is not manipulative or sinfully demanding or judgmental. I agree. Number two, we say that God's love is not the kind of love that abandons you when you mess up or bails out when the going gets tough. Totally agree with that. Number three, we, we, say, we, we say God's love is not legalistic. Like, I, I can't check off enough boxes to earn his love. You can't, you can't do that. That's not how the gospel works. I totally agree. It's not based on anything that you could do. We say that God's love is, is not just for the folks who are put together, that rough, dirty, broken people can come to Jesus just as they are. Now, let me put your mind at ease by saying I agree with all of those things. Totally agree with all of those things. But none of those things are actually unconditional love. Here's the problem. Okay, first, the word unconditional is a very vague, useless sort of word. When the Bible gives far more clear word pictures than that. The words we use to describe God are very important. Now, if you think I'm just John at straws, let me give you an illustration that helps you understand what I'm talking about. Imagine for me for a moment that you have three brothers. Okay? The four of you have a father who's worth $100 million dollars. Father passes away, and as he does, he leaves a will. And in that will, he says, to some of my sons, I give a portion of my money. You have questions. You have lots of questions. Because you need to know how much of that money is going to which son. But the, or the language is very vague. You understand that when we're talking about God, we're talking about things that are infinitely more important than some sort of physical, personal inheritance. And if we believe that words matter when we've written a human will, we ought to believe that words matter very much when we're talking about an infinite holy God, okay? So unconditional is a word that I think is too vague to describe the love of God. And so sometimes things creep in when we're talking about that. Now, when we say that God loves people, we have to understand a couple things. First thing, we have to understand common grace. Okay, here's what common grace means. Common grace means that all image bearers, including the most condemnable rebels and wicked people, somehow can enjoy God's goodness and experience the effects of his loving nature. In other words, even enemies of God can get married and have children and watch a sunset and eat good food and see good things and sometimes even act in loving ways towards other people. Those things are all common grace. In that way, I would affirm that we can see the love of God demonstrated in all of his creation. Okay? The very fact that he doesn't just wipe us out because we're all sinners is evidence of the love of God. You guys follow me? But there's another kind of love that we're talking about, and that is a saving love, what we would call salvific, which just means saving love of God. The only way the saving love of God is given through, is, is through Jesus. Because see, here's the thing. God said that we are to be holy, for he is holy. To inherit the eternal life that God had promised without the coming of Jesus would have required the perfect obedience to the law. Perfect obedience to the law is a condition. So understand what's happening in the gospel. The wrath of God must be satisfied. When we repent and believe the gospel, we are believing that Jesus has satisfied the conditions. Does that make sense? There's, there are conditions predicated on salvation. Repent and believe the gospel is a condition. So the saving love of God requires something of you. And don't let anybody tell you that it doesn't because that is utter baloney. The saving love of God requires repentance and submission and faith. 
So does God love everybody in common grace? I would affirm that God extends common grace towards everyone. But is God's love un unconditional? No, it's so much better than that. God met his own conditions in Jesus Christ. You guys follow me? Now, that's really important because sometimes we can talk about the gospel in ways that, that the God of the Bible does not talk about the gospel. So we'll say things like, come as you are. I totally agree with that. You come to the cross exactly as you are. Become expecting that you are going to be changed. And evidence of salvation is change. Christian people are different. And they're being changed. If you've managed to walk around saying that you're a believer for 50 years and nothing is different about you, I have every right to examine the tree by its fruit and say that person may not be in Christ. And there should be a danger involved there. There should be a concern involved there. Because we are called to examine our own souls. Jesus said a tree is told by its fruit. Good tree, there's good fruit. Bad tree, there's bad fruit. So come as you are, but you will leave different. You will leave transformed. It is so much better than unconditional. It's unmerited. You can't earn it. You didn't deserve it. That's often what we mean when we use the word unconditional, but that's not what the word unconditional means. You didn't deserve it. It means that all the conditions have been met and then given to you, and you didn't do anything to deserve it. And it is unfathomable. I will never, for the rest of my life and all eternity, be able to plumb the depths of the love of God. Those words are so much better than unconditional. So please use them. We give people a very confusing idea of who God is. If God's love were truly unconditional, then we should all eat, drink, and be merry. And there would be no need for the cross or the gospel of Jesus Christ because everybody would just kind of go to heaven just as they are. But that's not what the Bible says. If that is what you believe, then you believe evidence contrary to the teachings of Scripture. And I will wholeheartedly reject that. Okay, it's off a soapbox. That was my pet peeve. All right, now, how do we see this love? This is where we just said a tree is, is shown by its fruit. God's love is perfected in his people. Now, let me explain what I mean by this, okay? Jesus in John 13, 35 says this, by, by this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Isn't that fascinating? He doesn't say everyone will know that you are my disciples by the way in which you spout off all the cool Bible words. He, will not, he does not say that everyone will know you are my disciples by the way that you tell people how long you've been going to church. God's not impressed with how long you've been on this earth. He is well aware. He says, by this, people will know you are my disciples if you love one another another. Now, this is what I mean when I say that the problem with the letter of John is that it is too clear. All right, listen to this. So, so love is the mark of a Christian. Look at this. Verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Okay? My problem is I can't really read between the lines of that sentence. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. When we demonstrate this kind of love, then we demonstrate that we have been born of God and we know God. So what is the mark of a Christian? How do I know that a person is in Christ? John gives us a helpful clue. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. But it's this kind of love. Be careful. The love that seeks the good of others with no expectation of reward, especially if they are your enemies. That is the sign. That is the means by which we know that a person is in Christ. The fact that we love the God that saved us and we spend our lives yearning after him and desiring to grow in him. Those are the things that demonstrate the evidence that the love of God is in us because the love of God is working through us. Only transformed people can do this. Only people who've been transformed by the gospel can do this consistently. Now, a stopwatch is right two times a day. So every once in a while, somebody in the world might be able to stumble upon this. But Christians do it consistently. Let me ask you a question, friends. Actually, let me give you the second part of this. The absence of this is the mark of a non-Christian. Here's John with another sentence that we don't like. Listen to this, verse 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Again, the problem is not that we don't understand that sentence. Let me say it one more time. Anyone who does not love does not know God. That seems pretty clear. 
If your life is not marked by a consistent love for your neighbor and your enemy, then there's a real good chance that you do not know the same God that John did. I did not write that. I didn't try to add to it, take away from it, or make it sound any different than the Bible sounds. It seems pretty clear. It doesn't need much more explanation than that. Unless we're trying to justify our own sinful behaviors, in which case we need to do a lot of justifying. We need to do a lot of explaining. Friends, listen. Radical Christian love is the norm for Christianity. It is what is expected of Christians, a love that calls us to be kind to one another, to serve and care for those in need, to give expecting nothing in return, and to bless when we are cursed is the mark of a normal Jesus follower. You guys get me? Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that this is not an attribute that ought to be ascribed to a professional holy man only. Certainly. Pastors, missionaries, deacons ought to exhibit these things. But you know who else ought to exhibit these things? Christians. It's what we do. We demonstrate radical Christian love, and the absence of it ought to be like the check engine light on our car. The problem with the check engine light on our car is that far too often we just put a piece of black tape over it so we can't see it. Or you just learn to ignore it over time and go, oh, there's something wrong, but yeah, I'll get to it eventually, and you just ignore it. You just ignore the problem. Friends, ignoring the problem does not make the problem go away. I can confirm this to be true from years and years of having neglected automobiles. Does not make the problem go away. If there is a problem tomorrow, guess what there still will be? A problem. Guess what there will be the next day? A problem. Guess what there will be the next day? A problem. You guys picking up what I'm putting down? If your life is not demonstrated by the mark of authentic and genuine Christian love, the check engine light of your soul is on and it is screaming. And it is time for some diagnosis with the word of God. Now let me ask you a question that hits this a little bit harder. Take the last 50 posts you put on Facebook. How much love, true, authentic, biblical, genuine, selfless, effort-filled love do your social media posts display on a daily basis? I have taken a break personally, and so you will be pleased to know that that is not based on any evaluation of your social media posts over the last month. I had to get off of it. You know why? Because I found my soul, feeding my soul hate through the lens of my eyes by looking at social media was not good for me. It is not good for you. It is even worse if you are the source of that stuff. What does your social media presence say about the way you love God? Because here's, I'm going to give you a hint. It says a lot. Whether you want it to or not, it speaks volumes. Because the reality is it's far easier for us to post hate and wickedness and vitriol and bitterness on social media because we're not looking at somebody eye to eye. Very revealing. What does it say about you? What does it say about what you love? What does it say about how you love? Friends, we are called to love one another, and that includes what we post. And I encourage you to be careful. The carpenter's rule, measure twice, cut once. Do you know how much different your life would look if you would sometimes, if we would sometimes just read our posts before we hit send? That's the great advantage of, that's why, that's why younger people especially like Snapchat, right? It feels like social media with no consequences, but it's still there. If someone read it, it's in their mind, it's in their heart, and now they have evaluated your walk with Jesus by the way you post it on that. You understand it is critical, it is essential that we are always demonstrating and acting in loving ways towards people. That is what Christians do, even with people we don't like, even with people who annoy us. That's the hardest of all but it is the greatest evidence of the sanctifying work of Jesus Christ in our lives. Because what comes out of our mouths or out of our fingertips is what was in our heart. Think of the last 10 conversations you've had with people. How are your conversations known? Are you known for being a crass, rude, mean-spirited, difficult person? Then you are not known for being a Christian. Do you understand how those two things don't exist in the same space? Sometimes it is, it is better for us to be quiet and think and then speak than it is for us to just speak. And I'm the king of this. My mouth moves at least 10 times faster than my brain. But again, 
the, the, the development of relationships over the years has taught me that you cannot put toothpaste back in a tube. Once it's out, it's out. And it's always out. And it feels incredibly unfair when people start to, to, to make decisions about who we are based on what we said, except for the fact that we said it. And we would do the same thing to them. Friends, we are called to love one another. The most amazing thing about understanding this is that loving one another is exactly how we abide in Christ. Watch, it, watch how this works, okay? We, we breathe in the air of the love of God, right? So what happens is, is that, that God is the source of love. Jesus comes to earth, demonstrates perfect love, and achieves this work for us. Then our eyes are open. We respond in faith and repentance, and then we begin to love God. That love for God causes us to begin to see people around us, even those we don't like, who have wronged us and hurt us, as created in God's image. And so objects of our love, like we were the object of Christ's love, so we begin then to love our neighbors as ourselves and demonstrate radical love towards even our enemies and show that the kingdom of God has been and is being established on earth even as it is for heaven. That love for one another radiates towards heaven, and now we have this ecosystem of love that demonstrates that we are his children. It's how it's supposed to operate. And we are a part of that. We reflect his love and we radiate his love. And we show the world that our love is different because we are different. And the difference is the way we love. For far too long, we have defined the primary difference between the Christian and the world as in our ability to follow rules and check off boxes. The primary, fundamental difference for the Christian is not that you can follow the rules, it's that you love Christ and so love one another because that love for Christ will lead you to obedience. But we try to put the cart before the horse and we can't figure out why, we're, why the cart's chasing us downhill and we can't seem to catch it without getting run over by it. You, you, that's not how it works. Love God. Know God. And the love of God will transform his children, if you are not any different, after you have made your confession of faith, you must ask yourself, why? What's different? But see, we live in a culture where everybody's saved, right? I haven't had one gospel conversation in this community with one person who would look at me and say, yeah, I just hate God. I don't want anything to do with him. Everybody's going to heaven. Because we grew up in the South and we vote Republican and we, we you know, we're, it's just indigenously who we are. That is not the gospel. The gospel is that we are all wretched sinners desperately in need of God's grace. And because of his great love for us, he has opened our eyes and caused us to respond through faith and repentance. And in responding through faith and repentance, we are different creatures made new. If you have not been made new, you are not a Christian. I didn't make that up. Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he is a new Creation. Old things have passed away, new things have come. New affections, new loves, new desires, new passions. All those things are marked, are marks of having been transformed by the love of God. And then we demonstrate that love to others, and we see men and women changed by grace. Friends, God is love, but he's not only love. We're going to talk about some other things that God is, and he's all these things at the same time, and he's never not one of these things. But let me let you in on this, friends. It is good news that God is love, but in order for it to be good news, it has to first be bad news. And the bad news is this. You are an enemy of God. And apart from repentance and belief in the Lord Jesus, you will be separated from God and condemned to go to hell. I do not say that lightly. I hope you don't hear me saying that lightly, but it is a reality. There is another way. There is a path to living with God and being reconciled with God, but it is first, it is through the work of Jesus. The wrath of God has been satisfied on the cross of Christ as Jesus took on and absorbed God's wrath for us so that we could be free. That's why that verse in It Is Well With My Soul moves me so much. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. He's not saying that his sin is blissful. 
He's saying, my, the, the next, he's going to give us more explanation. My sin, not in part, not a little bit, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Your sin must be nailed to the cross. Repentance and faith. If the Lord is moving in your heart and opening your eyes to this reality, do not delay. All, here's all you got to do. All you got to do is, is confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. You'll be changed. But don't come to Jesus and expect things to stay the same. Cost is high. It will cost you your life. It will cost you your desires because he's going to give you new ones and better ones. But you must repent and believe the gospel. God is love, friends. Would you run to the cross today as a Christian or a non-Christian? Experience the love of God. And let the love of God transform your life. Let's pray together. We're going to play just a a verse of of one song because we like to want to think about the scriptures that we've taught and the things that we've said. Friends, I want to encourage you. Christian, I want you to consider the ways in which you have put yourself into voluntary slavery by harboring resentment and unforgiveness towards someone else. Friends, you're you're planting yourself in a pot that will hinder your growth. You've you've made a decision that you're only going to be able to love God this much. He has called you to greater things, to be free in him. And that freedom is a freedom because you are forgiven and a freedom to forgive others. So who's the person in your life that today, right now, you need to move towards forgiveness? It's going to be a consistent thing, and it's going to take more than one time. Would you, would you move towards a lifestyle, an intentional decision to cultivate forgiveness in your heart today? Non-Christian, you can experience the forgiveness of Christ and be free from the burden of sin. Would you turn today 